Okay, applause. Come on. <clears throat> so we, we are the first panel that is customer obsessed today that you are seeing. Um, how many people had wine with lunch? Who's not, no one's admitting it? I saw people with wine glasses in their hands. Okay, raise your hands higher because you're the people I'm gonna ask questions to. All right, so Amit was up here this morning and he was going through this litany of slogans and mission statements and positioning statements that these brands made, right? Starbucks is about creating community and American Express is about membership and Disney is about uh, guests and so on and so forth. And as he was saying all these things in my head, I was saying bullshit, 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 bullshit. How many people agreed with that? How many people heard, heard something cynical in their head w when he was saying that stuff? Okay. So who, uh, what I want to do first before we get into the panelists and their discussion is ask some of the audience members to give us examples of customer ex obsession in their own lives. Not their companies, but where they as customers, where you as customers had a great experience that is reflective of this term. So who had some wine over here with lunch that will admit it? Okay, I'm just gonna call on somebody. All right, you. Tell us, tell us either a def the definition of that term in your mind or give us a real world example where you as a customer experienced something which was worthy of that term. So I and who are you? Uh, I'm Eli from Optimum and I was just chatting with Asaf. So I missed the term that we would like me to define. No, I don't want you to define it now because you're with the company. So give us an, do you, can you come up with any examples of customer obsession in your own life? Um, I think um, she loved brand here locally at Israel for kids um, clothing and stuff. Um, quite, quite good at their marketing and being customer obsessed, I feel. But what does that mean actually? Give a real example. Um, trying to really tailor their offering to me and uh, catch me at the right moment to purchase the right thing that they would like to push my way. You're, you're, you've been a marketer too long. All right. <laughs> Who, who's, who's next? An example of customer obsession. You another Optimove person? No. Okay. Optimove, Optimove. Who's not an Optimove person? Yeah. Okay. Well, I was actually trying to recollect any cases of uh, obsession of myself being as a customer, and I can't. You can't, right? Exactly, precisely. Okay, who's who? Okay, you wanna you wanna give us? Some, I'm gonna trip over this camera here. Hi. Do I introduce myself? Yeah. I'm Ofer. I work at Fiverr, and I once pre-ordered a book on Amazon, and uh, like uh, two or three weeks later they sent an email saying that so many people bought the book that they can now lower the price and they returned like a dollar and something to my balance. It was good. Okay, that's a pretty weak example, but that's not bad. <laughs> All right. So, who are you and who do you work for? Alex, you start. Hi, I'm Alex Belarjan. I head up e-commerce at Dan von Furstenberg. Um, it's a 45-year-old woman's contemporary luxury clothing company based out of New York, uh, but with a global presence. I'm Alicia Singh. Uh, I'm with Talkspace, and I am their lifecycle product marketing manager. Just a bunch of words. Um, if you don't know what Talkspace is, it's a mental health app. Um, and right now, if you take the subway in New York, you get to see Michael Phelps all over the place uh, promoting Talkspace. Uh, so hi, I'm Lucian. I work as a CRM manager. Uh, with my team, I kind of cover the offsite touch point, communication touch points. I work for CultureTrip, which is a uh, company that operates in the travel, media, um, entertainment space. Uh, but we're basically trying to uh, write stories about what makes places and people unique. I'm Ron. I'm Ron. I'm uh, managing the CRM for uh, GVC brands. Some of GVC brands. It's a big gaming company located here in Tel Aviv. Can we only okay? And you let everybody win to, uh, to deliver the, against the customer to some extent, expectation? No, definitely not. So, so I'll do the same thing to you that I did to the audience. Give us examples of where you were customers and you had a, a really a, an experience that rose to the level of customer accept, uh, obsession. So I'll start. We said we will not mention but it's Amazon again. <laughs> so Amazon is really a, a 
customer oriented company but i'll give a negative example of an of a customer obsession marketing i was in london last week and i ordered a bunch of stuff and i got probably 20 30 emails if i uh, i'm satisfied with the delivery if the product came uh, as i expected etc etc and the bombardment of we want you as a customer we want you to be happy was way too much so this is obsession that should be treated in another way obsession gone wrong yeah exactly okay uh, i think the example i have is of uh, revolut uh, and uh, every time do people know what that is uh, it's it's an app yeah <laughs> banking app uh, i think there's an echo is it no uh, so the example i have is basically every time you travel uh, when you land in a country or they tell you what's the exchange rate and what what you can buy from for a shekel or a specific one and that's really good also when you're in the airport so I was in Heathrow uh, they kind of told me if I want travel insurance and I felt like that was a good uh, a good customer obsessed strategy tactic right. so are we are we uh, confusing good customer experience with customer obsession sounds uh, like yes. it uh, so I, I I don't think I think there people uh, have low expectations we heard earlier that there were rising expectations of of companies but these are these are tepid examples these are not such st super strong examples it's a good it's a good experience but I don't know if that's customer obsessed uh, well it depends I think it depends what you kind of want so one example I also have from inside the company which I kind of mentioned is the idea that obviously we have a web and website and we have an app and people sometimes take screenshots on their app um, and it's a question of why they do that when they can arguably they share it with a friend or they save it for later so why wouldn't they use the functionality that's within the product already so obviously I can create a uh, real-time campaign and send people a wish list uh, request or tell them to download the the article on their on their app but I can also go to the product manager and talk to him and say why aren't people using these function these features that we have and they're using the screenshot so that's an example of something that we as a business are kind of looking into. But customer obsessed. you have to go and sell that to the product marketing. Yeah, so I have to identify <laughs> how many events are happening and that way how many people do that, why do they do that and all that kind of stuff. And I think actually, Alex, you said something really interesting earlier today about how it's like an organizational shift, right? Yeah, for me, the customer obsession is not any longer just one department's mandate. Uh, for me, customer obsession is when it permeates the entire organization, whether it's structurally, um, uh, at DVF, it's physically where we sit. So typically siloed teams like retail and e-commerce, we're on separate floors now. We sit together. Um, and people from designers to down to true product marketers, product managers are thinking of the customer and what they do and ideating ways they can raise the experience for the customer, even if it's in the face of profits necessarily. But if it's right for the customer, all teams in the organization are thinking that way from the get-go. So grade your own organizations. I mean, you're you're talking, you're giving examples of of improvements that you've made that, that on the path toward customer obsession. Who who here is is in an organization that's worthy of that term? And be 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 honest. Is anybody? So, so I think the the key thing that in your question is what is this term? Because we hear in the past in the last five ten years, customer focused, customer centric, customer obsessed. Well, eventually, it's everything about the customer. I think that obsession for customer, it's behind the scenes. Because all of the time, we're trying to communicate and understand our customers. It's not something new. It's not new to us. It's us as a marketeer, as an organization, something that we do. The obsession is maybe you can look behind the scene and the understanding of a company that all departments should now be focused on the, on the customer. So the, the typical, let's say, fight in any companies between marketing, product, and R&D. Everyone has their prioritization. They want to do stuff. But now it's, we need it for the customer. So it's, I say it in my company, it's become much higher in the, let's say, in the, in the Jira, in the tickets that we are opening. So it's getting much more scaled rather than it used to be, OK, we need this feature. Why we need this feature? Because it's in the roadmap. Even if the customer. We don't know if they need it or not. They may need it. But the thing is that behind the, scene, behind the scene, we see more and more from the CEO, like Alex mentioned, top down, everyone thinking about the customer. So obsession in this manner is the understanding of the company, 
okay, the customer, it's what matter, and not the roadmap, and not bringing 10 more features, because this is the sprint we are working on now. So less about the product and more about the attitude in the organization? Yeah, I would say so. Again, eventually the product is what brings the money. So obviously we need to work on it, but it's no longer some people sit in a product meeting and say, okay, we have this killer feature. No one knows if it will work or not, but everyone committed for it. And then you see what happens when it releases. So this is the thing. Let's start thinking from customer. Let's bring the customer to the table. Yeah. Let's bring the customer to the product meeting. I know it's, especially with the companies of uh, 2 million customers, you cannot bring all the customers, but focus groups, uh, uh, retention people meeting the actual players, where it used to be, at least in my industry, in the gaming industry, it used to be the other way around. You have VIP manager, the retention, I'm managing the retention. We never met the players, which is insane. So in the last year, we started to establish VIP meeting the CRM, uh, the CRM guys, and we came with a lot of promotion that works really good. We didn't have to, even have to think about them. So it's easy job for us. Do, do people in the audience think customer obsession is a real thing or just a marketing term? How many people think it's just a marketing buzzword? I do. <laughs> you, you do, okay. And how many people think it's a real thing? All the Optimove people? Raise your hands, okay. Okay, go ahead. Why? Why is it just a buzzword? Because at the bottom line, it's always going to be this win-win situation. I think that is not baloney. Um, there is this like fine balance between doing what's right for the business, but doing it passionately so that the client is also happy. Um, you can find that balance. It's very tough. Um, it takes a lot of failures. It takes a lot of testing. And it takes a lot of fight. Um, and I think, you know, I'm going to kind of go into a little bit of what you said about like this internal marketing of talking to the product manager and he's like, well, I got to ship these like 10 things by the end of this quarter because it looks cool to like check, like, check box all the, like, the pieces. Like. Oh, God. <laughs> so this is actually why I've sort of switched. So it's really fascinating, I think, in a lot of like more startups or like more agile environments is that, you know, I come in doing marketing saying, okay, well, I have these like revenue goals or these subscriber goals. Um, but at the same time, I also, you know, I get to hear back from the customer. I also send those emails and I look into Zendesk and see what people write in. And at the end of the day, I, I realize what I'm saying sometimes is so off kilter. It is so wrong um, that I realized I was building in this bubble. So what ended up happening is I started to do a lot of um, integrations, software integrations, product integrations, and then also offering like selling the features that the clients actually want um, to our internal product team, which is now how I have this like weird title of lifecycle product marketing manager. More buzzword. Yeah, it's like too much. But at the same time, now I've, I've created that bridge and the rapport yeah, yeah. and the trust that now we're building features that people actually want. And hey, it's one big feature that it's going to ship at the end of the quarter. But you know what? You can at least say, I built this big thing and people are much happier for it. So Alex and Lucian, you have to talk more. This is what <laughs> we agreed. Yeah, so I think... Uh, I, I do believe that it might be a buzzword, but it's just uh, I think the way you look at it, so obviously there's customer centric, customer focus. I think this is just a 2.0 kind of thing where we're just revamping the stuff just to give it a bit more energy and uh, pizzazz. Uh, so, so, so how does it show up in your organization? So, in a, so our company is kind of, so as I said, this, we're a media company and we're going into the travel industry uh, and the booking industry. We're becoming an OTA, hello, lastminute.com. Uh, and I think we're doing that in the way that we kind of looked outside and there's people that get inspired from all these kind of sources, Instagram, uh, their friends on Facebook, all that kind of stuff. And they put things down in an Excel sheet and then they go to booking.com or lastminute.com and then they book a hotel. Well, we think there's a room to keep everything on the same platform and provide people with the inspiration, which we're doing very well. Provide them with a way of saving that inspiration on, on a wish list and then giving them the opportunity to book. Uh, stuff and share it with their friends. So that's a, I think that's an example that kind of goes beyond what's out there and kind of offers, uh, fulfills a need that a customer has, not something that they've explicitly told us that they need. So did your customers express the desire for that capability on your site, or is that a revenue-driven thing? We've got to find out. We've got to find a way to make more money, and so we're going to add booking into the mix. It's both. You always like every company wants to make more money. That's not. A, it's not. A, I don't think that's a. That's fair to kind of pick on that. Uh, and it's not something that the customer tells you explicitly. They tell you 
their problem or as I mentioned I think earlier you kind of look at the events the customer triggers and you can't just create a campaign based on those events you're gonna have to think what was this guy trying to do and make sure you kind of tick that box instead of uh, getting him to the next event that you know show gives you a higher propensity of him to buy something I want to hear from you yeah I think um, customer obsession is just a filter through which you can look at your organization where it's not a box you check, say, yes, we're customer obsessed. It's a journey that you're on perpetually where you're never going to quite be there because the customer expectations are always shifting. Um, but if you can even think of them in, in those processes, I think you're on your way there. Um, thinking about sort of branding and advertising back in the Mad Men days, it was, there was one brand vision and voice, and that's all the customer saw in the past 10 years. You thought of the customer, you're trying to personalize, but you're not truly thinking of it as an individual. You're saying, oh, well, you're a segment. so. 100 of you can get this message. And I think the future is getting down to the individual and trying to create those one-to-one -one relationships that you experience in a store with a great sales associate. Um, it's, it's a journey, though. It's, it's, it takes a lot of buy-in, a lot of selling internally. It takes technology to help enable it. But at the end of the day, we're all creating experiences with our consumers. And I'm not just selling dresses. I'm selling a dream of her confidence in a boardroom or her first interview. Or um, it, it goes beyond just retailing and selling it goes into adding value to her life in my case uh in his life and this is where companies. the little bullshit meter in my head goes in. <laughs> okay so i'll give you a real example so um we sell dresses we also do things that are totally not profit driving for us but that create community for our customers so we have, once a week have panel discussions and uh, networking nights for female founded female-led entrepreneurial organizations in your stores uh, in our store office space. It's a co-working space in Meatpacking District in New York. And there's no selling whatsoever in those events. It's open to the public. Um, it's a forum for female-led organizations to share their message and to recruit. Um, but it's, it's truly just to create community and to add value in a way that a dress doesn't do, right? And so that's where I think when you, uh, it's not bullshit. It's, it's doing something that's in the face of profits. In fact, it costs us money to host these events and have catering and whatnot and entertainment, um, but it's something where you elevate the experience and you don't just become the retailer, you become a friend and a, um, an, a, a resource to the, the customer. So but how Alex, do you know, uh, go ahead. Question. How do you deal with the fact that uh, in the retail, especially in the fashion, the time to market is way longer than any online business where we can hear the customer saying, I want this, we can develop it or not, but we can develop it right here, right now but you, you're doing this gala nights or whatever, and you hear the customer say, I don't like this dress, and then it's another cycle of, you, you mentioned something before, like six months. So how do you deal with this gap between the customer wants the dress in this shape and size and color to market time? It's a very specific and use can case. I, if I can <laughs> top add on that, and also oh. how do you sell that to a uh, designer that kind of thinks he knows what's best, he, he thinks the next year is gonna be uh, in fashion. So. I don't care what your customer said, they want blue. Like I'm making red because that's it's what people are gonna buy. Indoor and outdoor. Right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think it's a bit of an art and a science, right? So the science of it is the data you get, the amount of people saying they want this one thing or the number of times they're giving feedback on a, a product error. The art is that designer's point of view and there has to be a healthy tension. I think that's when you see great design work done in the retail space when it's a healthy tension between a vision and, and data and business-minded logic. Um, so the example we were talking about earlier is uh, at DVF, we had customer call outside the wrap dresses, which we were well known for. We're not printed on the inside, they're white, and it doesn't photograph well. It kind of looks a little bit chintzy. And so our designer said, why don't we take this opportunity to make reversible wrap dresses where the inside is a totally different print. That's not going to increase our UPT. She's gonna buy two dress, one dress and get two. Um, but at the end of the day, it was a product opportunity based on customer feedback, and we think it's right for the brand and better for the customer. Did you test that idea out with customers in any way? I mean, you got the feedback, but then did you go out into the market before you developed More it and, 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 yeah. and ask people what they thought of it? Yeah, we, uh, because our store is right below our office, we do have active customers in there daily. Um, so they workshopped it with the store associates and kind of had prototypes with the, the um, customers walking in. And the feedback was quite positive. Um, but it's, again, it's something that, there's no magic bullet. Like the, in that one use case, that takes six months to develop, yeah. right? From idea to on shelf. Um, in digital marketing, we can execute next day. Exactly. Yeah. So I think you have to be firing on all cylinders across the various execution and customer touch points. Yeah. You can ask him another question. No, I just want to That's okay. 
So, so one of the themes that we talked about, and you alluded to it just a second ago, the art and the science, the data and the vision, is this idea, you know, the, the, the 1.0 to 3.0 is turning the brand over or the experience over to the consumer, right? From, from the top-down vision, the one-to-many, to the many-to-one that uh, Amit talked about. How do you manage the, what certainly is tension between the one-to-one -one vision of all these customers who are now controlling your brand with their experience and their feedback versus the need for coherence and some sort of vision? How do you, how do, you do that, any of you, if you can speak to that? Alex, you could start if you want. Sure. Um, you know, I think it's, it's tough to personalize and hyper-segment while maintaining that brand voice and that sensibility. You can do all the trigger emails you want and just plop in product images, but it won't have that context of why we're recommending this to you in Florida and you always browse red dresses. We're going to show you short sleeve, low neckline red dresses. That copy context, you can't you can AI machine uh, derive that. That needs to be a copywriter kind of telling that story. So our struggle is going into a more one-to-one -one direction um, and, and scaling while maintaining that brand vision and voice. And I think that's why a lot of luxury players have been slow to this game is because they want to hyper control the message and the terminology that's used and what's put out there to the world. And they're all catching up. Um, and a lot of these DTC brands who started in digital and they're digital natives, they were way ahead of us because they didn't have those brand constraints from the heritage um, legacy that they've had. So it's a struggle. It's a, it's a balance of technology to enable, but also having that human touch. And you need to have sort of that, that context that a, a human brings to the table where a machine or um, a, you know, an AI-driven algorithm won't necessarily have. So it's, it's certainly a struggle, for sure. Yeah, I, th I think it's interesting because uh, it's obviously it's easier for us to kind of create products. Our product is content, and uh, we write loads of it. And it's an easier to uh, personalize specific communications to what people actually want. So a person, both of you might be interested in London, but one of you is interested in cocktails and one of you is interested in beer. So we kind of have all of those. So it might be still a, a London segment, but within it, you'd have a specific niche kind of portion. So that's kind of easy for us. Do you feel yeah. like that's manual? Because like that is actually my fear. Is like manual in what way? It's manual in that you have to kind of think of all those combinations and you actually need to create this. This is what we have up to. Yeah. So, I mean, that's, that's one question, but it's also, uh, so obviously we're investing a lot of time and money into content feeds mm -hmm. and figuring out what the, the users want. Um, it's, it is manual at this point, but it kind of provides a use case for what customers want. So they obviously, you know, search for bars and cafes in London, in the land on the London uh, article that we have. Uh, and then from that, we kind of build specific reading history of what that person wants. Uh, and as we know more of them, we kind of give them specific, specific things. So this can be one of the, the tricks in obsession because you want to achieve the ultimate goal is to know every customer you have. And if you try to tackle every customer with a different offer or a different uh, type of uh, how the website looks for him or whatever A-B test you want to perform, then the obsession is will just not work. The, the, the teams that are operating will collapse. The, the margin of errors is increasing way high. So the obsession should come in a manner of understanding your client, but understanding that when you're working on a mess, find this common language for the, the groups that so you need. So what makes a difference, right? Because I could do personalized content for each, but that mm -hmm. wouldn't necessarily make a difference in terms of money or retention or any kind of thing. Yeah, so, so again, money and revenue, this what pays the bills eventually we need to, to take care of it but it used to be at least in the in the gaming industry all the segments were based on deposit whoever deposit most more will get more and not about is this player a lot of time spending a lot of time with us is he is he good is he bad whatever so this dive into micro segments is is a true blessing and this is the the bi and kidding aside using a lot of optimal but we found ourselves sometimes struggling and going way, way deeper than we should into micro segments and finding ourselves targeting 15 players because, oh, they performed the exact same way, but still, there are 15 players. Though. So a customer, it's, it's a singular, but eventually when we work on a mass, it cannot be singular anymore. Who, who's a m member of an airline loyalty program? Who hates their airline that's also a member of the airline loyalty program? Right? <laughs> I just crossed a, a million miles with United, not this year, but lifetime miles. 
and uh, I despise their loyalty program. And they're forever pushing it in the direction of higher and higher spenders. What did you expect from them? What you chose the wrong airline. And Jet. <laughs> yeah. Well, all right. I, that's the the it, Team Delta. Okay. <laughs> all right. Clearly. So let me challenge you. Um, so what we're talking about is sort of the balance between customer feedback customer helping design the product or giving you uh, input about the product and and something else, which is maybe top-down vision or founder vision or something like that. So Apple Apple computer, no longer called Apple computer, Apple, right? Extreme example of this. Steve Jobs never took customer feedback into account. All It was all top-down vision and they were customer obsessed, right? He would obsess over the buttons and the colors and the fonts and for years and years and years, that worked really well. And, and Tim Cook, the current CEO, is much more uh, egalitarian, much more responsive to feedback from uh, users. And you could argue that Apple is in a much weaker position now from a product perspective than they were when they had a megalomaniac, monomaniac Genius. in control. Well, I actually think that has to do with like growth, right? So when you first come to market, there's all these, you know, you're trying to f fill that need of people that are reaching out, right? They're like, I need, in my case, I need a therapist. I can't find a therapist. It's really expensive, especially in America. So what do you do? You build an app. It's really easy to access. It's fairly affordable. Um, and from there, you kind of just decide, this is what I'm going to give the clients. And then at some point, maybe seven years later, you have to follow the data. You have to listen to your customers. They are no longer you know, happy that they can just send asynchronous messaging. They want to send PDFs of whatever. They want to send photos. They want to send audio messages. Um, they want integration with Alexa. So all of these things now we realize, and you know, I am, I don't want to say it's a constant struggle, but it feels like it sometimes when you want to say to the founders, you know, I think you guys came out with a great idea on board. We all love it, but now it's time to take a back seat. We have enough data. It's been years. Let's listen to the customer. So now we're putting together actual focus groups. We're actually gathering mm -hmm. this data. But then it kind of gets a little dicey when you start to send out surveys that are a little bit too leading sometimes, depending on who the product manager is. So, also, those who answer negative usually answer the most. So it's uh, always yeah. a problem. True. So this raises the question. So there's a difference between behavioral data that you're getting and survey mm -hmm. data and focus groups. So there's a question about whether customers actually know what they want. So I mean, uh, the, yeah. I'll give an example of something we had this summer. We saw a, a decrease. A, a, a big decrease in, in the numbers one day, and uh, we didn't understand why. So immediately we contact some of the VIPs that are more close to us and some other uh, uh, like messages and ask them what happened because we didn't see anything in the product that should uh, bring to a decrease in the numbers. Sad day for gambling. <laughs> and and you, uh, you were suffering declining usage? In usage, in deposit, all metrics basically. And then I think it was. Even three people said the exact same thing. It's Germany. We have a heat wave. We don't have air conditioners in, in our house. We are spending the time in the mall and restaurants. We just we don't want to play because we are outside. So immediately we get it together, all the marketing team, and come up with an idea of okay, let's buy ten air conditioners and do a leaderboard for the for those for all all of the players. And we stopped everything. So this is about okay. We said we have this uh, monthly calendar and we are doing everything is. We want to do it pre-planned. Not everything is possible, but we stopped everything and we did it. And in one day, we managed to come up with a leaderboard for all of the players. And it was the successful, by far, the successful uh, promotion of the year. And it was purely from listening to the players. We had all of the team is, sits here in Israel. And we don't sit in, in, uh, in Germany, which this is our main, for this brand, this is our main audience. Listen to three players, heat wave, okay, they don't have air conditioning, it's Europe, they don't have a lot of this uh, in, a, in every house. And we got amazing feedback, the numbers skyrocketed, and this is obsession, I think. So Listen to the uh, Go ahead. Qu question for Alicia. So how do you create that time and space to actually continue to innovate? Because customers don't necessarily know, they know what they don't like, they don't know what they don't even know. So I don't think anyone looked at a BlackBerry and said, this should not have keys. Let's wipe out the <laughs> yeah. keys and just make everything gesture based. So I think it's important to have that space to be a true visionary. So how do you incorporate that? So you're not just reacting to customer needs, but you're yes. creating customer needs. Almost. Yeah. So the proactive efforts there are really coming from, you know, honestly, we have a very diverse team and everybody uses different types of technologies. And what's really fascinating there is 
we do a lot of internal marketing, right? I show that this is my opinion. I'm going to go into this generational thing. You know, I live with my phone. It sleeps next to me. It's probably bad. But, you know, I have, like, my opinions of the best apps out there. So I'm going to take those opinions and show them, check out this example from ClassPass, check out this example from Delta. Um, and I sort of like kind of go in with that perspective and bringing in examples and try and be smart about it. Because at the same time, there are other leaders in this space, maybe not in mental health, but in subscription or in apps that I think it's totally fine to take from, you know? Yeah. So that's yeah. kind of how we do it. And then what I kind of do is like, I kind of ask the question, right? I run the email marketing. So I'll just send an email. I'm like, hey guys, what do you think about this? And there are some vocal people and I'll take it. In mental health space, it's really fascinating because you want to be able to cater in like a private way. And I think, you know, when we sort of solicit feedback from ideas, people are actually pretty open about it. So I'm wildly fascinated by, it. it's a testing, it's a whole thing. So I don't have the perfect answer, but it's kind of what we do. So a, a, key, a key point to what you said, it's about seeing other apps and understand what they're doing. So a lot of the time, it's not about inventing the wheel. We can just improve what we have. And this is important in, in terms of time to market because you see a good feature, you know in your head, okay, maybe I, need, maybe I need to think of something to compete with it, but yeah. why not just improve it and modify it to your customers, even by calling some customer and say, we're planning this feature, even explaining the same feature that you just saw, and ask what's your opinion, what would you want extra on top of it, so this is a combination of uh, it's marketing not only and competitors, right? It's also people outside your industry. That yeah, uh, of similar. course, of course. Listen to all opinion. Yeah. yeah. So you, go ahead. I was going to say, I think it's also important to think of not just the customer you have, but the yeah. one you want. And sometimes those are very different. So for DVF, we have a much older customer. She's 48 on average. It's kind of a perfect bell curve. And we're struggling to get the younger customer. So we're going at it from various directions. None of them would have said, we want to rent dresses. Um, we're not the first to do this. Uh, Rebecca Taylor's in the audience and I want to speak to you at some point. But we're launching uh, a rental business in February that's white labeled for DBF for what we're seeing as a macro industry shift from ownership economy to experience economy. We're Uber, Spotify, Netflix, Airbnb. Consumers, especially millennials and younger customers, want to experience something and not necessarily own it. And we went after that opportunity from a market fit perspective, not because younger customers said we want to rent dresses, but because we saw it as a way to go for the customer that we want and we think it's going to be compelling for that younger customer. So yeah. looking at not just the current database you have, but like surveying the field of who you want to be. Like have you run some test, test yeah. group on it, like focus groups, just people want? Like, or it's just an idea came Very from... Very informally. Um, we're a bit scrappy at DVF, so... Okay. <laughs> uh, and we've seen success and heard great things from those who have done similar. Um, uh, yeah, but so you already think there's market validation for that. Obviously, yeah. you talked yeah. about other examples. Yeah. I was going to say I agree with that because it's a... So we did a bit of uh, research into this, and we have like a big study that's called the uh, Cultural Mindset, and it kind of looks at how people travel, and uh, people think that the first thing you do is you book a hotel. You read some stuff, and then you book a hotel. But no one, I mean, the hotel is not that important for millennials and younger generations. Like, they care about the experience. So everything that's around the hotel, things that you need to do, all of those are actually the, the important things that kind of form a package uh, that, that makes, your, makes or breaks your holiday. So you, so you raise a really interesting and important question about uh, a different, different audience segments. And, and we've, we've heard different things today about, about treating different audience segments. And Optimove is, is all about that, obviously. Um, so how do you manage that? F do you obsess over certain customers more than others? Do you treat every segment equally? Do you pay attention to the most vocal or the most lucrative? How do you, how do you deal with that? It's, it's a mixture of, of a lot of things. Of course, you will always tend to, to treat the VIPs in, uh, in, in our industry, I think any other industry, uh, to give them much more attention. But eventually, if Define you... Define VIP for you. Sorry? Define who a VP, VIP is. A loyal, a loyal uh, deposit a lot, obviously, above uh, some certain threshold. But mainly loyal, because we can have a high roller coming in and then leaving us after two days. And if we will treat him like a VIP, giving him a lot of money without knowing and understanding who the player is, we, we just lost money there. And he will do it, he will go around every other ca casino, all the competition. He will try to fish for the, the best deal out there, 
which is legit from a customer point of view, but we as a business, we need to identify it and not going blindfolded, okay, we have a high depositor, let's stop everything, let's treat him, let's give him whatever he wants, a bottle of champagne, more money, money to his account. No, we need, like, loyal, this is exactly about obsession, loyal became a key factor in segmentation. So it's not, okay, we have this depositor, deposited so much money in the first five days, but okay, let's take a, 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 a second, think about who is this guy, let's do some research, let's talk to him, not, it used to be, early days in the industry, you just throw money at him, thinking you'll make him stay more, which works some, in some cases. But eventually you see the margin, you just, you will lose more on the, on the long term. So a loyal player who deposit less is not less valuable to you in your business than a, a player that just came in with a, lot, with a lot of money. Because also coming back to obsession and listening to the customer, a loyal customer that ran with you for three years is someone that you can call. Even if he's not a big depositor, you can call him, you can ask for his opinion. He probably went for like six product version with you in those three years, so he has a legit opinion. And he's probably playing in other places, so we say, okay, I saw in this casino, I saw this feature, why you don't have it? And then we stop, okay, maybe we should, or maybe it's not in the roadmap even. You know what's really interesting is I actually obsess over, obsess, but actually, um, anybody that's like a risk of churn, right? Because at that point, I think that's my highest impact. You know, you kind of go into any job, and I'm just going to get real real here, but like you come into any job and you want to make big changes. How do you make the big changes? Not just by driving that top level acquisition. It's going to be, how are you keeping people on your platform? Let's just say maybe the product's not where it needs to be or the service itself is still not where it is. But as a marketer, you have this opportunity or product marketing to, to really give the user the experience that they're looking for. So I'm actually looking at the people who had a bad experience. I 100% agree. Figuring out why, like what did I do wrong? Or what did we do wrong? And I think those are the tweaks that I'm making. The people that are actually happy with our platform, I leave them alone. A, a key, I don't talk a key to them. factor is understanding what is a bad experience. To understand and to, to acknowledge right. it. So, I mean, so, there's so many us, it's, variations. It's number. We, we saw a player that lost for two weeks in a row. We know he has a bad experience. How is it for you? In the, for us, in so it's really interesting, especially in subscription and mental health. Um, you know, there is a thing such as good churn. It just uh -huh. means you feel better. So that's great. <laughs> However, it's good <laughs> for them to come to the churn. management and say, we had some good churn. Yeah. But, you know, that's this is where the marketing plays a part. And, you know, I promote, I'm spinning sort of this story into, well, it's like your wellness. It's your, you pay for the gym, even though you hit your goal weight, you still shouldn't quit the gym, right? You, you got to maintain it. Same with your mental health. So that's how I figured that one out. But there are other pieces too. People come in with expectations of, you know, feeling better within 24 hours. And my job is to sort of level set on those expectations yeah, yeah. or cost. People don't know that therapy is generally very expensive, expensive, especially in the US. So again, my job is there to either make that cost shift. And what's really interesting is something that we're working on is thinking about different types of plans based on engagement with the platform versus just like a weekly basis, you know, payment plan, right? Because I think at that point we realize I'm looking at user engagement and behavioral marketing and that's what's driving me, which is again why I'm going into the risk of churn. Are they risk of churning because they're not engaging or okay. losing or not so, feeling better? So are there any questions? For, I mean, we'll, we'll keep going. We've got five, five minutes and change left. Are there any, does anybody want to say anything or ask any questions? I have a question. Yes, oh. I'll start. <laughs> I wonder how many here in the audience and in the panel, how many give attention, how many marketers that say give attention to employees, I mean like uh, marketing teams, uh, uh, how many give attention for them listening to CS calls? It's literally sitting in CS for a day or two or an hour a week or whatever, just listen and understand the player, or getting this really detailed uh, 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 report from customer support, because this is obsession in its easiest way. This is what the customer wants and complain about. Mm -hmm. Detect it, decrease it, and here you have obsession as it best. So I just wonder how many give it a... Uh... Does anybody in the audience, there's one hand, so only one person, two, so start. a few. So the company, a few. So Brooklinen, which I, referenced earlier in our private discussion, uh, our direct-to-consumer brand in the US. I don't know if they're international. What do they do? Like they're, sheets. It's, it's sheets, but they're moving into uh, furniture as well. 
they they every new employee has to do two weeks of customer service yeah. every single one regardless of what their what role they're hired into the, the for, for precisely yeah, yeah, that yeah. reason it's super important but you know what is a little scary sometimes so i do this at talkspace i really encourage especially when we have interns come in for them to sit with the cs team at least for a day Again, I get daily emails reading everybody's complaints, so I like to scroll that first thing <laughs> to know what my goals are for the day. But um, what's really interesting there is that sometimes I worry that people will build in a bubble. Yeah. They'll say, oh, this one person had this fiery response to whatever, oh, yeah, and then they build it and like, listen, that was one person. But exactly, we need to know to screen it, how to say, okay, don't get panicked because it's one. Okay, but on, on the same note, think why he said it and if it can, uh, be an indicator to a much wider uh, issue. Okay, we're going to accelerate now to get through more material in three minutes and 50 seconds, okay? So um, the role of failure or mistakes in becoming more customer obsessed. You talked about it, paying attention to your uh, churn customers or your negative experiences customers. What, what, what role does uh, do mistakes play or failure play in this process of becoming more customer obsessed? I was going to say, I think it's uh, important, so I kind of mentioned earlier that sometimes uh, your users don't actually use a specific product functionality. Uh, and instead of kind of accepting that as a specific failure and looking at why they're not using that, you tend to throw more money or resources at that or push more emails out to kind of get people to use that feature. Instead of should accept the failure and then go back and see how that feature would, should have been better integrated with different things. So that kind of helps you. That's, that's the role of failure. So. You, you just have to jump in. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, very talkative. Uh, for us at DVF, one thing we've done is um, we have monthly fit try on sessions in our uh, stores below the office with everyone from CEO to customer service to e comm to logistics. And we're all hearing customer feedback that they've received over the course of the month on fit and things that are not working correctly. And I think to accept your failure is to be very self aware. Um, I think a lot of, to your point of building in a bubble, a lot of brands lack self-awareness of where they're, they're dropping the ball and to, you have to be very humble to accept your failure and to act on them, but it's important to continue to try to meet that customer obsession. How, how transparent are you about failures to your customers, right? What, how do you deal with failure that's public or do you make failure public? I think it depends on how bad the failure is. Luckily, we haven't had one so bad that we have to sort of do a mea culpa yet under my watch in the past year, but... Um, Compensate it, the player, yeah. usually. Okay, super, super users versus ordinary users, social media influencers, super VIPs. Are you listening to these people more? Do you care about them more versus the democratic mass? Or how do you, what's your orientation to that? I think it's, we shouldn't listen to them all, but it's, it's becoming this way because they have, eventually they have more impact. So talking about obsession and everything and everything we've discussed in the last 40 minutes, Eventually, we need to think our why as a revenue as a, as a key factor. So, yeah, whether you want it or not, it will be become. Just going back to a mistake. So this is a perfect mistake. We had two VIPs that complained about something, and we stopped everything and we changed all the plan because two VIPs and it made no difference because it was only two. two there were only two opinion, and this is a mistake. We listen. They are the, the right players to listen. They are really important, but. We made, we spent a lot of time, so it's not a mistake to ward the players, but internally it was a mistake. And uh, yeah, it, it happens. Again, we are human. Okay. Uh, I was going to say, is it quickly? Uh, is it random chance, or are those, are those people VIPs or super users because they went on a specific path or because they were looking for that specific thing? I think ideally you just try and put people on a super user path and then see if that provides a similar result. So the, the, the discussion we haven't had is what's the right met metric to measure whether you are customer obsessed or fulfilling that definition, but we're at 39 seconds. So instead of that question, one thing you want to say about this idea of customer obsession that's really important for the audience to understand. Say it quickly and then we'll go this way and that's the end. Uh, two things, not one. Uh, one, I think that you cannot manage what you don't measure, so you have to be communicating a uh, metric like customer lifetime value or LTV to CAC ratio to the board level. We have it in our quarterly board meetings. So if they don't understand that, it's not going to trickle down to the rest of the company. Um, I'll just leave it there, actually. Go ahead. Um, I think for me, it's balancing the good and the bad, right? Don't always just listen to your bad customers, <laughs> but also don't always listen to your good customers. Don't think too highly of yourself. 
think you need people with the uh, that are sp have a specialty, but also look at the overall thing. So eventually, it's about the customers, but don't forget you have knowledge inside the company, and people with knowledge use it, combine the customer in it, and I think this is the key for winning. Okay, please join me in thanking the panelists for their excellent <laughs> thoughts.